This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. So welcome once again, folks. Here we are, Dr. Charles Parker at Core Brain Journal, and this is going to be a very interesting, uh, Yeah, I know I say that all the time, but hey, if you're with me on this, you know these folks that we're talking to are exceedingly interesting. They bring a different dimension into our lives. And tonight we have an individual who was an athlete in college, who was a serious Yale student, and in the process somewhere along, which he'll tell us about in detail, turned himself inside out with drugs and alcohol. I didn't know alcohol, but I certainly drugs were there. And so he's going to tell us all about it. He's currently writing a book. Teddy Teese, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for having me on, Dr. Parker. I've, uh, I've listened to a few of your podcasts, and I've uh, found them all very, very intriguing and even made some uh, life changes based off of them. Oh, well, that's <laughs> great. I mean, the people that we're talking to, it's such a privilege for me. I've been practicing psychiatry for 45 years. And I feel like if I've been doing it for 45 years and somebody can still tell me something, then others can learn from it because it's just going to be a great learning. It's an opportunity for me as well as everybody else out there. So, yeah, thanks for sharing. I appreciate your kind remarks. So, so let me go ahead and read your intro, and then we'll talk about you and get, get on because we really want to hear what your, what your thoughts are. So uh, Teddy lives in Oakland, California. He developed a disordered eating problem in conjunction with a substance abuse problem in order to keep his weight down low enough to be eligible to row as a lightweight in college. Now that's an interesting point. I'm going to ask him about that. I talked to him a little bit about that before we got started. I don't know what a lightweight is. I know what a novice is and I know what varsity and junior varsity is, but I don't know the lightweight, so we'll hear about that. Even after he quit the team, he remained chemically dependent on amphetamines and opioids to function and while he continued to focus on his body as the vessel of his identity, the whole thing was falling apart for him. He eventually left school and ultimately found his way into the wilderness therapy, which we'll be looking forward to hearing about. This wilderness therapy saved his life and allowed him to reconnect with his real underlying humanity and, and the natural world. Uh, eventually he went back to school, wrote about his experience and the experiences of half dozen other student athletes, this is a key point, student athletes who were having some problems and who were struggling with some of the similar problems. So interestingly from his point of view it was remarkably easy to find interview subjects. This is not good news folks. And now he says I understand there is a broad based problem with our collegiate athletic system which we're going to talk about tonight. So he has a Yale University bachelor's degree in American studies. Again, thanks so much for joining us, Teddy. So what are you up to now? What's going on? Uh, right now, um, I'm working on a couple of, uh, couple of startup companies. I found my way into sort of innovation and entrepreneurship completely unexpectedly. Um, and that's sort of my, my day job. Um, but what I'm really passionate about at the moment is trying to take the same framework that I used to uh, interpret um, what was going on in college sports and apply it to uh, American society at large huh. and, uh, and to see, you know, if I can't understand some of the problems that we're experiencing in this country, uh, namely, you know, a, an addiction epidemic and in particular an opioid addiction epidemic uh, through a similar lens. So that's something I'm, I'm very excited about uh, and, and learning more about every day. Um, it's very interesting. Let's run back to how you had the wake-up call, how you banged your face on the concrete a long time ago. You know, and you weren't on concrete, you were banging your face out there rowing crew. So tell us, I got this busting question here, what is the lightweight part of the team? What is that? So um, there's, there's two different uh, weight classes for rowing. There's lightweight and then there's open weight. Um, 
When I first started rowing uh, in high school, that was open weight. I didn't know that there was a lightweight category. Mm-hmm. Um, and it became my passion, the, the open weight rowing. It became my everything. Uh, I was excited to go to practice, you know, even if I was exhausted from uh, staying up all night studying for a test. And, and really those moments out on the water um, with, you know, seven other guys, um, day in and day out are, are some of my uh, fondest memories, well and truly. Mm. Um, when I learned that there was a lightweight category, um, I got intrigued because uh, like most um, rowers, like most athletes at a high level, you know, we want to be the very best that we can. And um, because I was on the on the edge i was not clearly an open weight nor was i clearly a lightweight and so in order to be the best uh it seemed to make sense to go the lightweight route um going into university Mm -hmm. and so i applied to schools um just like any you know anyone else would athlete or non-athlete um but i i reached out to coaches um, and told them, you know, this is my height, this is my weight, um, and I would like to row uh, under this lightweight uh, category in so university. So what is that weight, lightweight uh, cutoff when you go to college? So uh, in the fall, it's for men, 165 pounds is the uh, very maximum that any single rower can weigh. Um, and the 160 pounds is the boat average. And then um, in the springtime, that drops down to a boat average of 155 pounds and a maximum weight of 160. And um, for some perspective, I sit naturally these days now at around 190, 195 pounds. Yeah, you look like a big uh, guy. Are you tall, too? I mean, I'm, I'm seeing you on Skype here. You look like a, a, a definite moosey kind of guy. So how tall are you? I'm six foot one, um, uh-huh. which is pretty standard for most lightweights. Um, the difference with me is that uh, I'm I'm quite stocky and bulky, mm-hmm. and um, that growth happened in college. So I was kind of lanky and tall when I got recruited, mm-hmm. and then in like my uh, pretty pretty early on in my freshman year, I just started to fill out more as I matured and. Gotcha. So uh, I had to, you know, fight against that sort of genetically predispositioned growth uh, by restricting my calories to, you know, next to nothing. Mm. And, and that's when things started to get really quite hard for me. Well, let's run the tape back just a little bit further so we can get this complete narrative together of you and your rowing history. So did you row high school in Oakland? Were you, were you raised in Oakland? Um, I was raised in Oakland until I was uh, 11 years old, and then I uh, <laughs> I was shipped off. No, I, I went quite willingly at the time, but I, I went to boarding school at 11 years old in western Massachusetts to a school called Eagle Brook, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I was far from home, and, you know, that was certainly a, a difficult time early on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I kind of got used to it after a while. And, and the following year, my brother, you know, came out and joined me. And, and there was some bonding around that. And, and so I basically um, entered the, uh, the system of, you know, uh, higher education, East Coast higher education at a young age. And then, you know, basically applied uh, to my first prep school um, my eighth grade year at Eagle Brook. So then I went from Eagle Brook to a school called Andover, uh, which is near Boston, Massachusetts. Yep. And uh, that's where I started rowing. Fantastic. So at Andover, you rowed Exeter. You know. You, <laughs> yes. Exeter did. would have been your arch rival up there. I, would, I, I don't know if they were your arch rival or not, but they would have been a serious rival. Oh, they were, yes, our number one rival. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and then, then the New England Rowing Championships would be a very big deal up there because those schools are so such fine schools, 
and uh, and the teams have a tremendous reputation. So then they must have did they recruit you for college to to row, or did you apply and just throw the the crew thing in there? How did all that work? So um, my my dream was to row in college at you know a very high level. Um, we won uh, the New England. Uh, championships at Andover, and then we went on to the national championships and um, got second, um, just barely edged out by another crew. And uh, I got recruited um, to row, um, but because I was sort of on the line between lightweight and heavyweight, I, I decided to go lightweight uh, in order to get into a better school, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, basic, um, yeah. I, <laughs> My good friend, you know, he's 6'4", and, uh, you know, had a few pounds on me and could row faster, and he went to Stanford, and, and I knew I wouldn't get into there because I wasn't tall enough to be a heavyweight. They didn't have a lightweight program, so I, so Stanford wasn't on my list. Um, well, that is so characteristic of rowers. I mean, they are tall, lanky guys who are muscular, tall, lanky guys. I mean, when you're tall, you've got that... You got that leverage on. Doesn't matter whether you're port or starboard. It's just, it's the principle of the thing. <laughs> so, right. So then you did get into Yale. Then so that worked out. I did. Yes, I was. I was thrilled. Uh, felt very fortunate and optimistic and excited. Um, however, I I did know, you know, when I kind of when I signed up uh, that uh, my weight seemed to be increasing. Uh, while, of course, the lightweight limit was staying the same. Mm -hmm. So um, between high school and, and college, I actually ended up uh, dieting heavily and, and losing about 15 pounds uh, and then, you know, continued to, to try and maintain that as the season went on. So then how did it, it look like uh, somewhere in there you wound up getting amphetamines? They decided you had uh, attention deficit disorder. How did, what, how did the opiates and the amphetamines start to fit into the whole situation? Well, as anyone who's prescribed um, Adderall or any of those other uh, amphetamine medications will tell you, they're highly effective at uh, suppressing appetite. And so... Um, in part, I was diagnosed, you know, but uh, I also knew where to get uh, those substances in order to, to help me um, lose weight. Um, so that just became a mechanism um, of, I would say, a performance-enhancing kind of mechanism whereby uh, I could basically starve myself all day and still function. So you so, were, did you not, eat, so you were just buying them then, you didn't have, you were doing the street thing, you didn't actually have a prescription written, is that what happened? I had both, so mm -hmm. I had prescriptions eventually for uh, probably a dozen uh, different pharmaceutical medications, um, you know, oxycodone, uh, Adderall, Focalin, Xanax, uh, antidepressants, bipolar medications. Um, I was being prescribed everything under the sun without actually having been officially diagnosed with anything. Um, oh, man. But, but at the very beginning, I was, I was buying them uh, more than I was yeah. being prescribed. Well, did, yeah. you have a pain, did you have a pain syndrome that you were talking about, or how did, all, how did the OxyContin come on board? So um, at first it was just, it was just the appetite suppressants, um, you know, the amphetamines. And when I got to school, I was able to, you know, teach myself calculus uh, without going to class and not eat a thing and go to practice. And, you know, I felt like I was on top of the world. Um, but as, as it happens, you know, with any sort of pharmaceutical or drug, you build up a tolerance. And so I had to continually take more and more of it. And what ended up happening is that I, I couldn't sleep. Um, so I, mm -hmm. you know, remember just kind of not sleeping for days and days and days and thinking, well, when, when, where does this all end, you know? And yeah. I think 
I think I was getting pretty depressed by that point, yep. um, kind of at my wit's end. And um, right about that time, I think when I was kind of at my most vulnerable um, and, and most, uh, most depressed and most exhausted, uh, a friend of a friend sort of said, have you tried this, uh, this drug called Oxycontin? I said, no, what the hell is that? Sure, I'll try it, whatever. He's like, it'll help you sleep, I promise. And so, yeah, I gave it a try. And uh, I don't know if it helped me sleep, but I, I certainly didn't care whether or not I was asleep or awake after that point. Uh, it suppressed my appetite as effectively as any amphetamine mm. and basically washed away all of these psychological concerns I was having. And so, mm. you know, in the moment, uh, it seemed kind of like a, a gift. Um, but, you know, there was a part of me that definitely knew um, that that there is a, a dark side to it, you know, as well. Well, just pause for a moment there. I want to say something for our audience and pardon me for putting my clinical hat on for a second. But... I think it's important to know, and, and uh, not that you're going to be revisiting the stimulants, but what happens and what you were describing was that you were coming out the top of the therapeutic window. So when you were taking too much, you came out the top of the window. And interestingly, what people don't know, and you may or may not have known, I don't, I don't, obviously we haven't talked about this, but what the top of the window when you're actually getting toxic feels intellectually and cognitively like the bottom of the window. So that what happens is there's a draw to take some more and what the additional, as you get more and more toxic, you have shorter and shorter periods of time that you have focus and concentration. And so then what happens is then eventually there is a flashpoint where the person crashes because they've blown out the top entirely. And, uh, and that sounds like what happened and they came in and got the Oxycontin to sprinkle a little, you know, salt and pepper over that, so you could, so you could chill a little bit when you're actually your mind was being blown. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's probably the best clinical diagnosis I've heard so far. <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to hear that it happened to you. So, so sorry to interrupt your story. Let's take it down where you were then. So then, what in the heck did you do? It sounded like you were reaching catastrophic proportions. People do, and one of the things I, I, you know, I wrote a book about this. I wrote a book called Deep Recovery, uh, not, Deep Recovery on Addiction, and I wrote a book on, uh, on uh, new ADHD medication rules. The whole thing with medication rules, I have numerous, I think it's probably mentioned in there, suicide, depression is probably mentioned in there like 30 times. Because what happens is mm -hmm. when you get into the state that you're in, it completely, forgive the street expression, discombobulates the dopamine and the serotonin and the dopamine going up pulls the serotonin down and you're constantly doing if it wasn't as serious as this I jokingly call it with the person that I see this happening to the Wiley Coyote effect you know this is serious I don't mean to trivialize what happened to you because it's, it's, it's really deadly serious but what happens is the person just goes off the cliff in the afternoon and then they start using the amphetamine to cover the depression so you have a double kick going on. One is you're coming out the top because your brain is all over the place. And then you're getting depressed. And the uh, amphetamine has a, a, uh, an antidepressant effect as well. But what happens is the more you take, the more you get depressed. And then you, get, then you go around the bend. So in other words, that's just another, another piece of the whole thing. So what did you do in that place? So I just, let's get back to you as a person in that situation. So I finished up the year I finished up um, the rowing season um, and I think I was you know kind of applauded by my coaches for uh, losing so much weight it was kind of like a miracle I brought the boat average down and um, you know I think we got some not so exciting place uh, in the you know New England or championships for freshman crews um, and I went overseas. I went to Germany to do an internship and, um, I figured I would just be able to kind of stop taking all the things that I was taking, mm -hmm. um, by, by getting away from that, you know, situation and that stress in that environment. 
Um, and, and I was, but I mean, I went through withdrawals for the first time there and it was, it was hell. I mean, yep. it was, again, that just turned into insomnia and, you know, the depression mm. was still there. Um, and so, you know, all of the underlying conditions actually got worse, um, without these, uh, band-aids that I'd been using. Um, so I realized that that the path that I was on was not sustainable and I needed to get off of it. Um, and I realized that in, in, in kind of, you know, in pretty stark terms, I, I, I think I was bordering on, um, you know, suicidal and yeah. depressed and all that. So, um, I went to, uh, a wilderness retreat, uh, that where they taught sort of natural movement training. My brother just happened to kind of rope me into it. And it was only a week long, but I think, you know, that will tie into it, to my story later because that was where I was able to actually feel good again um, for a few days, just kind of moving out in the woods and eating good food and, um, you know, not being on anything. Was that and in I Germany actually, or was that back here in the States? That was back here in the States. That was a company called uh, MoveNet, um, which, you know, they started a movement around getting people kind of out of the office and, and back into this more like paleo kind of state. Um, it's a very cool program. Mm -hmm. um, but but the, the founder there um, helped me kind of resolve that uh, when I went back to school, I, I wasn't going to row any longer um, and I was going to, you know, try and, do something less stressful that allowed me to, you know, eat and, and basically have more of like a normal college life. Um, but I think, uh, as many people who have tried something as strong as Oxycontin or have, you know, gotten, um, chemically dependent on, on amphetamines will tell you, um, it's not so easy to let them go. Yeah. And and they and they wouldn't let go of me when I went back. So uh, even though I I stopped rowing, I switched to rugby, which kind of gave me an excuse to have all sorts of injuries and be in pain and you know beat myself up. Um, I I was still taking you know these these drugs and they were you know being prescribed to me at that time um, by a doctor uh, back home. And, um, so I just had this secret. I just had this deep, dark secret that I was living with. I was going to class like everyone else, doing my homework like everyone else. Um, but, but, um, I was, I kind of was living a double life and, mm -hmm. and those lives eventually, uh, they eventually clashed. They mm -hmm. eventually butted heads in a big way. Um, so fast forward three years, I, you know, made it to my senior year just before finals and uh, I was staring down this 80 page senior essay that I had to write in order to graduate and uh, and going through withdrawals every day and I and I just I wanted to stop um, and I couldn't and that's really when it came to a headway I I couldn't do uh, what I was doing any longer and so I I left I uh, I withdrew from school um, under sort of the auspices of uh, physical, the injuries that I had sustained in rugby um, and went about um, doing anything I could to, to get better and fix what had, what had gotten so wrong. Mm. So that was like in the last, what, what month of that, your senior year at Yale, that must have been absolutely horrible. What, year, what month was that? Uh, that was November. So I, I went home for Thanksgiving break. You know, I'd I'd been visiting the local methadone clinic in New Haven, Connecticut every morning before class. I mean, the, 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 the juxtaposition between, between that and a, a Yale classroom is, is pretty, yeah. um, pretty <laughs> bleak. I mean, um, yeah. so, uh, it's a big distance. Working. It's a long, long trip down the street for that one. Absolutely. It really, it really is. If, if you've ever been to a methadone clinic, it's a, it's a very sad place to be. Um, and um, I just couldn't, I couldn't continue to, to do my schoolwork. So I left for Thanksgiving break and um, 
I remember telling my mom, I said, you know, kind of ominously, like, hey, mom, um, if I go to school, if I go back, like, I, I, I'm not I'm not coming back home again. You know, that that was sort of what I said. And, oh, damn. And, uh, uh, and she knew what that meant. Um, and so uh, I, I'm very fortunate, you know, to have a supportive family. And um, I kind of just let go of the reins, stop trying to do everything myself, mm-hmm. and um, and got in touch with uh, a doctor actually, um, and did a, a detox in my home. Oh, you did. Um, that would be, that would have been detox. difficult. So he did he see yes, you? How did how did you? How was what was the it. procedure on that? <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, what was the procedure on that? How did you actually accomplish that? Because that's a feat. There's no question about it. We worked, I worked in addiction medicine for years, and I know we were always trying to figure out ways to provide the structure outside of a hospital setting for different individuals. And I just wondered how he managed to help you out in that regard. Well, um, to, to make a long short story short, I mean, it wasn't enough. It didn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, I got off of the opiates, but then... I was put on a bunch of kind of like replacement drugs. And um, although I wasn't addicted to opiates anymore, all of the underlying issues were still there, you yes, know, and, yes. and, and amplified. So mm-hmm. um, in some sense, it worked. Uh, mm-hmm. Chemically, I suppose it worked. Um, but but in the long term, you know, uh, I actually, I needed more support. I needed more structure. Um, and I went into a, an inpatient um, setting. Okay. Um, and I went through a few different tiers of that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the first was um, like kind of more of a psych ward, I would say, um, at a very renowned institution called the Menninger Clinic. Um, oh, yeah. And that was a bit, a bit too acute for me, but... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it was good in that I had a, you know, a place just to be stable for a little while. And, um, after two weeks there, um, I was in the, uh, the wilderness of Southern Utah, uh, backpacking around the desert. And, um, I did that for three months, uh, of, you know, camping outdoors and not, not really doing anything that, <laughs> I had been accustomed to no creature comforts. You know, it was, it was, um, it was a very grounding experience. It was a very challenging experience, but I think it's the experience that is now defines who I am as a person more so than, than anything else. And, um, yeah, if you want to talk about that, I can, yeah, I can let, talk yeah, about Yeah, you got my you know. curiosity going on that one. I definitely would like to hear it. So the, when, uh, just listeners, when he said acute, what was going on, I'm, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, Teddy, but what was going on is you were, you were in an acute ward with more, more psychotic, psych, psychologically disturbed people, which was then kind of incongruous with what your problem was. So then, but you were there for two weeks. They probably used that time to detox you and make sure you were safe. And then somewhere in there, what's the transition between that two weeks at Menager's and being in the woods in Utah? How did that take place? And, and did you have a support system in the woods, or was it just you out there? So um, you're exactly right. Um, those two weeks, you know, um, I used to look around uh, for sort of other options that were you know, a little bit more suitable for, for my state and, and my needs. And um, my my family and the doctors that I was working with um, helped me find this place called Expedition Therapy. Um, and that's the, the wilderness program that I went to. It, it's different from most wilderness therapies in that we did some really fun stuff. Like we built model airplanes and flew them around and like, went uh canyoning and you know got to kind of drive around in cars and it it was very much not um it wasn't punitive at all i know some of them kind of uh are are like you know um have more of a militaristic uh, approach whereas this one was was very supportive um and i was out uh, uh with a group of other people you know dealing with things similar 
to what I was dealing with and around, you know, the therapist would come out every weekend and we'd have, you know, a chat for a couple hours. And then there were, uh, the people who'd be out in the field with us and, um, just that whole, that whole experience, um, was really what saved my life. I mean, I got off every single medication that I was taking out there, save for uh, a vitamin, um, which I need because I am have a, you know, genetic mutation that means that I don't produce enough essential neurochemicals. It's called methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. Um, MTHFR. Which, you know, a lot you of people, find out if, a lot of our listeners know about MTHFR. Yeah, so you're right on it. And uh, right. So you were taking, right. you had a, so you I, had a methylation I, problem, and, and this was helping correct the methylation problem. Exactly, and I think that was the really, um, the, the thing that um, was the best about the Menninger Clinic is that they kind of, they ran every test in the world, and one of them, you know, showed this this mutation. So, um, you know, that, that's been huge. But, um, yeah, the, the wilderness experience, um, was uh, was an opportunity to to reconnect with um, not only myself and the natural world, but but other people. You know, we were going through something challenging together, mm-hmm. and uh, in in some ways that was similar to rowing. I mean, I I forged very strong bonds with the other um, men and women who were out there. Um, it's a little tricky because, you know, some of them have made it and some of them haven't afterwards, and, and that's tough. Um, but it was, it was just a, it was a reconnecting experience that uh, anyone going through, I think, you know, any kind of psychological concern can benefit from. So how long were you out there in the woods then, Teddy? Uh, I was out there for three months. Three months, good. So you then you were out there till the winter. You 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 basically did the spring and uh, spring and summer out there. I'm trying to get the times together in my mind. Yeah, yeah, you're right on. Yeah, you're right on. Um, did the did the spring and summer out there, and um, and then you know they they do not recommend transitioning from that sort of environment right back into. Uh, you know your your daily life as it used to exist because everything's changed and uh, and you know um, it's it's very challenging to go from being out in the woods for you know ninety days to back into a city. So mm-hmm. uh, they recommended what is called a step down facility. Uh, I went to one in Colorado that didn't suit me so well. Went to another one in L.A. That suited me a little bit better. Um, uh, there, though, they were kind of prescribing AA as the uh, solution, and 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 sort of I felt like forcing me to identify as a an addict and an alcoholic and mm-hmm. be sober for the rest of my life. Um, and I felt like you know that wasn't really um, for me either. Um, mm-hmm. So I eventually left that. Uh, facility against the advice of everyone yeah, yeah. who's been, you know, helping me along the way, because I kind of knew at that point, I, I know myself, and and uh, I know what I need to do, yeah. and uh, so I left and, and kind of went off on my own and, and removed that cushion and that safety net, and I think that was very, very important. Uh, I saw a number of people who were um, kind of institutionalized in rehabilitation and in treatment, and dependent upon it, mm-hmm. and I really, uh, I did not want to get to that point either. So mm-hmm. I, I think I left when the time was right, um, and and I went to Oregon and uh, spent some time there. Got involved in you know things I was passionate about. Started reading and writing and running on trails and kind of you know met a girl and you know things started to feel like okay I can. I, you know, things are, things are back together. And, mm-hmm. uh, then I, I reapplied to school and, um, and then went back to Yale for the, the summer program and then finished that year. Congratulations. It's a big deal. Stepping back on the train. 
Uh, that's a very big deal. Yeah, yeah. No, it felt it felt good, and um, most importantly, I was able to, um, to to write that eighty-page senior essay on something that really matters. Um, it was on the psychological concerns of student athletes. It was I was you know on one hand trying to understand myself better, and in and in doing so, um, learned about kind of the broader. Uh, power structures that you know that influenced me, but also many of my peers, uh, sometimes in a in a negative way. Well, and you were also awarded. You you're not saying this, but I know it from your bio. You were awarded a uh, significant prize for that essay. Yes, yes, I uh, was awarded the uh, Norman Holmes Pearson Prize. Um, Honorable mention. <laughs> what what so does that they, mean? What does honorable mention mean? Uh, it means they created a new prize for me. <laughs> oh, they did. Uh, yeah, the the guy who actually won it wrote. I mean, he he broke the story on a 1920s um, like he he broke this entire piece of history that nobody ever knew about, and and so you know he won the real thing. But then they were like, well. Yours is really, really good too. So we're going to create this honorable mention for you. Oh, good for you! <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll take it. You know, I'll absolutely. Take it. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're a writer as well. Then you, you, you certainly are articulate. It's fun to listen to you because you got great language skills, and the pictures you paint with your words are, are definitely there. So you can you can live them with you, and you you have a. You're, you're very articulate about wrapping your arms about, around what happened to you, so it's very, very cool. So then, what did, where did you go with that? Where, where did you pick up after that? So, um, after I graduated? Yes. I drove my Subaru out back, uh, back from New Haven to California, kind of taking my time along the way. Mm -hmm. And I was convinced that I was going to be a journalist mm -hmm. and uh, submitted a number of pitches to a number of magazines. And, you know, by the time I made it uh, back to California, I hadn't, I hadn't uh, gotten any bites. So, um, uh, thing of all things, I jumped into entrepreneurship. <laughs> Oh, interesting, um, yep. I um, kind of hatched a plan with a friend of mine to create uh, sort of like an Airbnb for uh, guided experiences. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we pitched the idea to uh, a company called Juicy in New Zealand. And uh, they loved it. And they said, you know, come on out and uh, we'll, we'll listen to your pitch and, and we'll partner on this and, you know, see if we can't get this off the ground together. And so that was sort of the, the next chapter in my journey. Um, and just for some context, New Zealand is where my, my dad's from. I've got family there. Uh, I was going there anyway. Um, oh, fantastic. After yeah. graduating, but this well, sort of gave me a, you know, a real project to work on. Well, spell, spell the name for us on there so I can get it in the show notes if you would. Well, um, the closest thing to that startup, which we've closed the doors on, is now actually airbnb.com forward slash experiences. So part oh. of the reason we, 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 we shut that down was because Airbnb started doing it and uh, basically, you know, they're Airbnb. Yeah, right. <laughs> they were a little larger than you, right? <laughs> yeah, a little bit better funded, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, but but we we learned a ton and um, kind of pivoted into um, into the space I'm in now, which is uh, which is expert services actually. So the the thinking was, well, you know, what's the value of an experience? Well, you learn something, okay. Well, how can we scale this? Uh, well, let's have people do virtual experiences using virtual and augmented reality. Uh, and what we learned is that what people really want to you know pay for and value is um is uh strategic consultations uh so we kind of took that notion thought well if we're going to build this we're going to build this from silicon valley so i came back home and um teamed up with um a couple guys who've been in the expert witness space for you know i think 40 odd combined years and now we're we're working on a, a venture uh together in the uh, expert services and litigation finance space 
Wow. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, that's that's one of my day jobs, and and the other uh, is uh, a company called Yol Trips, uh, Y O L Trips dot com, and um, I fell in love with the company pretty much immediately when I met the founder because they put together a program that basically synthesizes all of the things that I found so valuable about wilderness therapy and um, open that up to, you know, people from all walks of life and in particular, you know, high performing corporate executives, industry leaders, um, and, and, you know, anyone who, well, I think anyone from anywhere can benefit from the programming, but certainly in this day and age, you know, um, where we're working, if not harder than certainly in a more stressful sort of context, uh, using so much technology, it's, it's hugely important to kind of step out of our uh, day-to-day and, and, and do something, you know, that connects us with the natural world and with ourselves and, and, uh, and with others. So Yule Trips actually combines mindfulness, yoga, nutrition, and service. Um, so I've got, I've got calluses on my hands from, from a trip I went on last week uh, from gardening at an orphanage in Baja, Mexico. That must have uh, been so much fun. It it was a heck of a lot of fun, and you know, I I loved watching the same thing happen with the group out there that happened in my wilderness therapy in you know three or four days, which is the bonding, you know, people feeling nourished and ignited and connected to one another and to others. Um, and so that was just sort of magical to watch and, and, and it's very much a company that I hope, you know, succeeds, um, uh, you know, in a big way. So are you with them or are you contracted with them or how does that work? Uh, are you, are you part of the company or are you, uh, a contractee, whatever you would say, how does that work? So I'm helping them out with kind of whatever it is that they need the most. Uh, gotcha. Right now, it's just spreading the word. It's, it's letting people know um, about the company, about the trips, uh, about the fact that you can go on single days in the, you know, San Francisco Bay Area. So, you know, you don't have to take a week out of your working life. Maybe just take a day and you get that whole cohesive, you know, magical experience. Um, and then also the, the, there is the, the option to do a longer, more extended version. Well, that is very interesting. I've, you know, I'm looking at the time here. That time went by so quickly. I think we've been talking for 20 minutes, and we're, we're cooking along here. We're, we're, <laughs> we're pushing 42. Sorry if I'm, I'm rambling no, a little bit. No, you're not rambling at all. I'm not saying anything remotely critical. I think when all I'm doing is saying how much I enjoyed the conversation and, and how picturesque it was in a lot of ways and how hopeful it is for a guy like you to come in and say, listen, I had uh, some really tragic things happen to me in my lifetime. I really f- fell from a very high place. Uh, I worked hard, hard, hard to get to that high place, turned inside out, and reconstructed myself. And you've been kind enough to share with our listeners how you did that. I mean, that's why I think it's really worth it listening to this a little more because you are making a difference in people's lives just by chatting with me because, you know, a lot of people are going to be listening to this and there are going to be some people saying, hey, if this guy did it, I'm not a rower, I'm not a Yale person, but he has a ticket there and perhaps I can get on that train. You know, it's something that perhaps I can do if I just reframe who I am, where I am, how I'm thinking about my life and sit down and do things differently. Very encouraging. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing the moment I open my mouth about, you know, some of the things that I've struggled with, how many people kind of, you know, will pull me aside and say, hey, I'm kind of going through something like that, too. Uh, Or I know someone's going through something like that, too. And I think uh, the most important and and the most straightforward steps that anyone, you know, going through any kind of... uh, challenging a situation with regards to mental health 
um, or addiction or depression or disordered eating is, is to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, we come from, you know, this, this history of, um, of, of talking about our psychological issues as being a, a taboo. And mm-hmm. it's, it's very unfortunate because now thanks to, you know, fMRI technology, we can see, uh, that a psychological injury is just that it's, it's, you have a broken leg. Okay. We can see that on an x-ray. We can see the broken bone. Well, if you have a broken brain, now we can see that too. Yeah. And there's no difference between them. Yeah. And the only way we're going to solve these, these issues is, is to start talking about them. And understand the biology, which you said so articulately several times, you know, Hey, these things can be measured. Uh, and certainly that's a strong pitch in terms of core brain journal, but, it's more than measurement. I'm not really reducing everything you've said to, hey, let's measure these things. I'm saying it, measurement is information. It's a part of the reality. If the reality can be understood, you can wrap your arms around it. You can do something about it. And, and that sounds like you had a number of really cool people, you know, both kicking you in the butt and dragging you along and just working with you as colleagues out there in the woods and, and wherever you happen to be. And I'm, I'm sure you didn't quite say this, but I'm sure that the people that were with you on the crew team were also those memories, that experience was uh, useful and helpful in rebuilding your current life. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that Yale was a trash, it's that you got a lot out of Yale. You had a very experience, uh, important experience, and you mastered the reality of not mastering the reality. That's getting back on the horse, no question about it. Very big deal. So listen, I want to wind up. We got to, I, I don't want to wind up. I didn't say that correctly. <laughs> we're, we're running out of time. I'm thinking about the people who are just going to be loving this thing and driving to work and like, oh gosh, this is going to, you know how the time when you listen to a podcast is like, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to get out of the car now. This was really an interesting <laughs> conversation, you know? Yeah, no, I, this is, this is very much uh, a subject that I, uh, uh, and learning more about every day, and um, and certainly your point about measuring uh, rings true. Um, and so, one of my goals, uh, you know, this year is is to actually profile uh, addiction in in many of its forms um, because it comes in so many different shapes and sizes and colors, um, and to really, you know, see if we can't. Uh, as a country, as a as a people, and as a species, see more in common with one another, you know, mm-hmm. and um, and break down barriers by actually uh, understanding what what an addiction is, um, mm-hmm. because it is non discriminatory. You know, mm-hmm. it crosses all socioeconomic classes, all geographies, everyone, everywhere has or knows someone who's been touched by some form of addiction. And then if that's not an opportunity, you know, to, to come together, uh, I don't know what is. Well, and, and that whole thing, it really in a, in a way, and I'm being somewhat reductionistic when I'm saying this, and I don't mean to trivialize anything you've said, but we're all human beings. We're all coping with changing reality. And that is where we're either coping with it successfully or we're not coping with it successfully. And I think the thing that's really encouraging about a guy like you is there are maps out there that can take you into those territories that have not been previously traversed. And I liked what you said about recovery uh, not really being cookie cutter. I think there's too much disrespect in recovery. You know, you're nothing but a drug addict. Until you get that straight, you're not going to go anywhere, my friend. How many times have you heard something? You haven't heard it because you've been staying away from it. But... I heard that. I worked in addiction medicine for years, and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm here, because how do you rebuild somebody while you're stepping on their face at the same time? I, it doesn't make any sense yeah. to me. Yeah, I, I mean, I heard, I heard versions of that, <laughs> for <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> well, I'm going to let you go now, Teddy. Uh, I want to say one other thing. We're going to have a thing up on the uh, show notes. Teddy and I were talking about this. He is writing a book, and he has been kind enough to say when the book comes out what we're going to do is collect emails we're going to shoot them out to Teddy and what's going to happen when that book is available he's going to do a uh, a drawing 
And he's going to give that book away to one of our listeners here. You guys have been kind enough to hang with us here for these, uh, you know, almost 50 minutes. And uh, Teddy has uh, expressed his appreciation about that even before we started. And he says, hey, let's do it. And so we will do that. It'll be on the show notes and uh, we'll get that list together. And Teddy, thank you so much. Uh, you weren't sure about what the title of the book would be. We kind of toyed around with it just conversationally, but it's something about addiction perspectives in a new light. It's going to be something like that. And uh, yeah, he's going to he's going to put it together. He's the writer. Uh, I'm not writing his life. He's writing his life. So I'm just throwing that out there to uh, have a little hook to hang on. And uh, so I, anyway, I appreciate that. And and in the meantime. Um before it's published, I'm, I'm going to be blogging um, as much as I can uh, on a weekly basis um, via uh, medium.com forward slash at Teddy Teeth. Um, yeah. Say that so again, that Teddy. I, I meant to mention that. We talked about it earlier. So it's medium, M-E-D-I-U-M dot com at forward slash at all one word, Teddy Teeth, T-E-E-C-E, all one word. That's right. All right, my man. Thank you so much for sharing. It's been great. I mean, yeah, I'm, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you, you're doing a great job out there. Anything we can do to help you along the way? If you want to chat about something else that comes into your mind, just give me a call. We'll do another talk. No problem. Uh, absolutely, and I'll, I'll keep listening to Court Brain with uh, with great interest. Thank, Thank you, Doctor Park. Thank you, buddy. You have a good one, man. You too. Bye. Bye now. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.